Jesus is kind of weird. Um, I don't mean any offense. I just thought I'd get that said. Um, you know, let's just, let's just be, let's keep it real between us friends, okay? Just between us friends. He's a rabbi. He's a teacher. He says he's the son of man, maybe even the son of God. And his teachings are just kind of like complicated, right? On the one hand, lots of love. Love your neighbor, love God, love with everything you have. On the other hand, you have the sense that if you kind of screw up, Jesus might get mad at you. Now, have you ever had that sense? That there's some stuff that Jesus isn't really feeling. And um, like, for example, something about rich people in the eyes of the needle. I don't like to talk about that text because I like the rich people I know, and I don't want them to feel uncomfortable, but it's in there. Um, for example, this whole idea about, you've heard it said, you can get divorced if your wife misbehaves, and I say, <laughs> Moses only gave you that law because you're chicken-hearted and you just had to, you know, have an escape clause in your marriage. I mean, not exactly like that, but kind of like that. That if you marry again, you're an adulterer. Well, I was married before, John. I don't really love that text. Jesus' stuff is hard and weird. Somebody say amen. amen. And then just when you think you know what Jesus wants you to do, he'll come along and give you some really strange teaching about how the people that are outcast should somehow be a part of the kingdom of God. And that's exactly what's happening in this text. Now, Jesus has been, you know, bipping and skipping around Jerusalem, healing people, you know, making the lepers um, be cleansed and making blind eyes see. And now he's in Jericho and he's been doing lots of miracles. And, and when he gets uh, through healing people, he starts talking to them in parables in some ways that are kind of confusing, but, but he lifts up these people who are contrarians, like the tax collectors. So there's a parable about a tax collector and a Pharisee. The Pharisee is good, tithes his money, does all the right things, shows up in synagogue, is a good upright person with a nice upright wife likely. And then there's the tax collector. And in the parable that Jesus tells, the tax collector shows up as like the hero. The, 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 the Pharisee is praying, oh God, thank you so much for making me not be like the thieves and the robbers and the bad guys and the tax collectors. And the tax collector says, God, you know, have mercy on me. And Jesus tells that parable and lifts up like, really, this one right here? This is the one that's saved. And now, now, here's this guy, this wee little tax collector. Did anybody in church school learn that song? Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little man was he. It's a weird song. He climbed up in a sycamore tree because the Lord, he wanted to see. That's how they taught us this when we were little. Um, this little guy is a tax collector. And you might be thinking to yourself, I don't really like the IRS, but they're not that bad. <laughs> well, these tax collectors were Jewish people taxing their own people on behalf of the Romans. And so they were like traitors. They were like anathema. They were marginalized. They were horrible people. And this little one wants to see Jesus. Maybe, maybe lots of reasons. He's heard that Jesus is a healer. Maybe he just wants to know what all the fuss is about, you know. But he wants to see him, and he's little, and he's doing that thing little people do. You know, um, us tall people don't have to jump that often unless Jim's in front of you. Um, but, you know, the, he's just trying to get in, and he can't get in. And you know how crowds are. Don't try to queue up and get in their way. So they're elbowing him and keeping him back. But he has to see. He just really has to see Jesus. He makes a fool of himself. He climbs up in a tree. It's not cool. It's not cool. It's not sophisticated. It's kind of embarrassing. And then Jesus embarrasses him further by going something like, yo, you little dude in the tree, come down here. Come, yeah, come on, come down. Everybody's now looking at the spectacle, and Jesus says, I'm going to go to your house today. I must go to your house today. Now, this is just, this is just plain strange. 
It is. There, there is no reason that Jesus, who's the rabbi, wants to go to the house of the tax collector because the tax collector is not just odd, anathema, unjust. He's unclean. He's ritually unclean. Um, does that make sense, what I'm saying there? He's just, he's, just, he's just not right. There's nothing about this that's right. But Jesus honors him and says, I'm coming to your place today. I just want to say kind of plainly that when Jesus makes these kinds of choices, his approval rating goes down. <laughs> right about now, his approval rating is in the low 40s. Like, like who are you with the, with the outsiders being welcomed inside the reign of God? First of all, the Jewish people are very, they're very serious about their reign of God, right? They're very serious about this. Why? Because they're, they're under the oppression of the reign of Rome. The Romans are occupying them. The Romans are occupying their land. The Romans are taking their money and they're using their money to build roads for chariots and to build horse carriages. They're not using their money to make sure the school system's working. The, the, the Romans are using their money to, to support corporate subsidies. They're not using their money to make sure women, infant, and children get milk. The Romans are using their money to increase empire. They're not using their money to build infrastructure that'll make their lives any better. These guys are preoccupied with the reign of God because they are looking for a way out, a way beyond the terror and the stress and the strain of this life. They are expecting the Messiah to come back and heal their land. And the Romans have got their feet on their necks. The Romans have got their backs breaking. And these guys are like, God, when are you coming and how soon? They are preoccupied with the occupation and looking for a way out. And I don't know if this is true just for these ancient Jewish people, but when we're feeling stressed and pressed all about I think we want God's reign or heaven to be something particular and something special and something just for us. I don't think we want everybody up in the reign of God when we're feeling stressed and pressed. In fact, I think if we're really honest, we're wondering if heaven is a club that will have those people in it, do we want to be there? Maybe what we're really wondering is, if heaven is a club that'll take us, is it really any good? We don't like it when Jesus changes the rules. We can't bear it when it seems to us that there's room in the kingdom for those women who are preaching in the sanctuary. Who do they think they are? And those gay people, come on. God surely doesn't have room in God's reign for those folks. I'm not even sure if we're really ready for multiracial congregations. I mean, do you really want to sit with people who don't look like you to worship God? Come on. Sadly, too much of the church is about gatekeeping. Too much of the church is about erecting barriers. Too much of the church is about keeping people out so that the thing can stay pure and wholesome and not be unclean. And so there's Zacchaeus, a little guy, a hated little guy, and Jesus is putting him in the center of the narrative, making him a celebrity. All of you are listening to this sermon about this little weird guy that doesn't really have a place. Not really. He's kind of an outsider, an outcast. That makes me think about something that happened a couple of weeks ago in a church pastored by Marvin Winans. Have you guys heard this story? It's a pastor who uh, was going to do a baby blessing, and he um, was approached by a single woman whose name is Chastity, 
Charity, Charity, and whose baby's name is Joshua, and she wanted to bless her baby too, but sadly, Charity is not married, and the pastor did not want that unwed mother's baby to be blessed in that sanctuary. A lot of internet buzz, especially among the clergy and theological people about that, lots of negative reaction, and you know, always we are quick to put somebody out, so there was a lot of negative press on Reverend Winans, he's a good guy. He's a close friend of a friend. But that's where he's at, theologically. He's at this baby shouldn't be blessed, despite the fact that Jesus says, bring all the children to me. The ones that have colds, the ones that are snotty in the nose, the ones who need their diapers changed, and the ones whose mothers are not married, bring them all to me. That Jesus, he likes to break those rules. Thank God for rule breaking. If it weren't so, my little divorced self wouldn't be able to stand here by the grace of God and preach this gospel that saved my life. Thank God for rule breaking. Because if it weren't so, so many of my staff and colleagues and friends wouldn't be ordained and doing amazing things in the world. Thank God for rule breaking and knocking doors down. Or a woman named Bobby who was one of my congregants at a church in Trenton. Bobby who was addicted to crack when I met her about 15 years ago. A mother with three babies, with three different dads. One of them, a little girl named Aaliyah, was a prototypical crack child. Four years old, hyperactive, learning disabilities, and just frankly, a tough nut to crack. One day, Bobby came to my office to visit me and was talking about her addiction, was hoping that we could do something, pray something, some way where she could be healed. And I said, Bobby, what do you, what do you want me to do? I, I don't know, what do you want me to do? And she said, Jackie, I don't know if I want you to do anything. I just want to see Jesus. And I'll see Jesus with you or without you. That's what I'm looking for, is I just need to see Jesus. And it's all going to be okay. Now, this isn't a story about magic. This is a story about a woman who put herself in a 12-step program, a woman who cleaned up her life, a woman who worked three jobs to send her kids to private school in Trenton, and a woman whose little baby, Aaliyah, just left yesterday for the Air Force, yeah. all grown up and loved and nurtured in the loving arms of a woman, thank God, for rule breaking, a deacon in that church in Trenton, and now a city planner, respected college graduate, went to seminary for a year, decided her ministry is for the laity. Amen? Amen. Thank God that in that place called the wane of God, there's room for all. There's room for a sinner like me, someone who's imperfect, someone who's frightened some days, someone who's made mistakes and been forgiven, somebody who has occasionally felt untethered and tossed about turning all around in space, wondering when and where God was going to grab me and hold me fast. Thank God there's room in the reign of God for someone like me. And friends, there's room for Zacchaeus, there's room for that little baby named Joshua, and there is room for you in God's reign. It doesn't really matter how you call God. I'm reading a wonderful book by Deepak Ch Chopra called The Third Jesus, this wonderful Indian, fantastic mentor of all of us who talks about the sort of Jesus of love and the Jesus of rules, but the third Jesus that's about the consciousness that we all can achieve in our higher mind where we not only listen to the teachings of Jesus, but we become the teachings of the Christ. We not only think about how to love, we become the love. We not only think about how to harness the light, 
We be the light. There is room in God's reign for all of us with our questions and our doubts and our confusion and our uncertainty and our fear and our untethered souls. There's room for figuring it out, for screwing it up. There's room for standing up and trying to get it right. There's room for getting on our knees or being in our yoga poses or standing in our prayer closet or just sitting with a friend having a cup of coffee saying, help me, help me be the better me. There is room in God's reign for all of us. And found by the God who sees us up in the tree, out in the crowd, in this space, on the subway, at work, found by that God. You got to know, for Zacchaeus, it made him lose his mind. <laughs> wow. No kidding, God. I'm going to give you half of everything I have and give back four times anything to anybody I cheated. I got to talk about the response to that kind of grace can make you lose your mind and get a new one. I, I pause about my personal story because I want you to hear it the way I mean it. But I used to be a corporate chick. Uh, $85,000 a year in 1985. That was a lot of money back then. Plus commission, selling copiers. And um, having been lost and found, feeling tugged by the umbilical cord of love, tethering me to my call to ministry, I left all of that and went to seminary, or seminary school, as my mother says. And I like, graduated with a three-year master's degree and made $19,000 a year. 19. That's 85 to 19 plus school debt. And I tell you that story not to like breathe air into those prosperity gospels and like it's not magic. I didn't put offering in the plate and presto change, oh, then suddenly I was okay. No, no, that's not what happened. That's not what happened. But what did happen is that I learned how to live with more hands wide open trust. I just, I just had to. I had to look at my budget. I had to think about my tithe. I had to focus on God. And I saved my little money and I bought a little house, one of those little houses that are going to be given away in the auction. And, you know, things happened. Like, and now I'm here. And I'm here again, not because of magic formulas, not because of praying a certain prayer, not because of stand up, sit down, fight, fight, fight but because God sees me, saw me, and drew me, tethered me, and kept me, cared for me. And I'm nobody special. God sees you, loves you, cares for you, is connected to you, will meet you at your place of desire and try to give you what your heart needs. That's my testimony. That's Zacchaeus' testimony. He needed to be seen and loved, and he was. So, how to wrap up. There are so many ways and places in our life where we just don't feel like we fit or belong or are welcomed or cherished. You are absolutely cherished in this place. And this place is a symbol of the place called God's love. You're welcome. You're welcome, Bear. That's a big gift in this little story, a big gift in a little package, a wee little man named Zacchaeus. If you're at home listening or looking, God loves you. Dude, God loves you so much. So much. Hang on to that.
I need your help for the benediction. I need, I need a beat. you can go. No tree too tall, no depth of the earth too far, no situation too bleak, no act so base, nothing makes you unwelcome in God's reign. Period. Love. Grace. Period. I love you. Have a good night. Thank you.